Good morning, everyone. It is good to be with you this morning, and I hope you're doing well. Uh, I don't think there are any, any announcements to actually share with you this morning. I will just say that we are beginning to meet together again in person on Sunday mornings. And so if you have been watching our services online, and if you would like to join us, uh, we begin at 1045, and you, of course, would be uh, welcome to come and visit. We're going to look into God's Word, but uh, before we do that, let's just commit our time to Him. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that we are able to meet together again in person. We thank you for your word that we are able to read, to study, and to learn from. And we ask, Lord, that as we look into your word now, that you would just speak to our hearts, uh, that your Holy Spirit would guide us into truth. Help us not just to be hearers of the word, but doers as well. We don't look into your word, Lord, just uh, as weekly exercise, but uh, we want to be changed, and we want to live for you, and we want to be transformed by your word. So we ask that you would do that, and help us to live uh, for you. So we commit our time to you now, Lord, and uh, we ask that you would bless it. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, and if you would like, turn to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. We have spent three Sundays in chapter 1 of Job, and we are going to finish our time in chapter 1, and we're actually going to move on into chapter 2 this morning. We're going to read about Job's two responses. Job got hit with two waves of suffering. The first we read about last week, and the second we're going to read about this week. And we're going to consider uh, his first response to the first wave of suffering, which we read about in chapter 1 at the end of the chapter. And we're going to consider uh, his second response that he gave after the second uh, wave of suffering. There are many different ways of responding to suffering. Some people respond with anger, some with resentment, anger, frustration, despair, doubt. There are many ways to respond to suffering. Job's response, his initial response was nothing like that. His initial response was most admirable and inspiring and serves as an example to us as we shall see here this morning. So we're going to commence our reading in chapter 1 and verse 20 and we're going to read through to chapter 2 and verse 10. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Job, he endured the first round of suffering that Satan inflicted upon him. And he did not curse God. He did not turn his back on God as Satan suspected he would. Job endured the test. But that wasn't the end of the story. Job's suffering wasn't over. Round two was to come. 
In the first round of suffering, in the first wave of suffering, Job, he lost his livestock, he lost his servants, he lost his children. In the second round of suffering, in the second attack on Job, in a second attempt to get him to curse God, Satan, having received the green light from God, took away Job's health. We see this in verse 7. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Now we do not know what exact form of sickness Job was suffering from here. We don't know the specific disease that Satan had inflicted upon Job. With that said, if you read through the book of Job, Job makes mention periodically to some of the symptoms that he is experiencing here, the physical symptoms. And we get a picture of just how greatly uh, he is suffering here in regards to this physical disease. We see in verse 7, which we read, that he is suffering from sores. Elsewhere in the book, in chapter, se uh, chapter 7, verse 5, we read that worms had formed in those swords. Also in the same verse it says that he has scabs. In chapter 9 and verse 18 it says that he has difficulty breathing. In chapter 30 and verse 30 he, is, he says uh, he has fever as well as peeling skin. Not a very ideal situation here. He's suffering greatly physically from a disease. Job, despite this however, he still did not curse God. As Satan, of course, suspected that he would. He did not curse God. This is actually where we are introdu introduced to Job's wife, uh, Mrs. Job. This is where she comes into the narrative. We read about her in verse 9. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. It would seem that in Mrs. Job's mind here, there is a relationship between cursing God and dying. If you curse God, you will die. It's a cause and effect relationship there. In her mind, uh, death might have been a favorable option for her husband at this point. She's watching him suffer, and she just simply says, you know what, death would be better than this. So curse God and bring on death, because that would be better than this. Some people are very critical of Job's wife for her remarks here. However, I think it's important to keep in mind all that uh, she has suffered. Job has lost his ten children here. Well, she has two. She has two. She's lost everything that he has lost. Her security, financial security, is, it's all gone too. I think we need to be somewhat gracious to her. One commentator, he wrote, One must remember that though she was not physically afflicted, she also suffered the loss of her children and wealth. Now it appears that she would lose her husband. Let us not be too hard on her. We're not going to focus on Job's wife here, though. We're going to focus on Job and his response to both of these waves of suffering. And we're going to look at two elements of his response. We're going to look at... His belief in the sovereignty of God, his belief in the sovereignty of God, and his posture of surrender to God's will for him. So those are going to be the two things that we look at. First of all then, this is point number one, God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. Now what do we mean by God's sovereignty? When we say that he is, so uh, that he is sovereign, what are we getting at here? One commentator described God's sovereignty just in this simple way. God's absolute rule and authority over all things. God, he rules and he has authority over all things. This includes the weather. This includes nature as a whole. This includes kings and the rulers of nations. He has authority. He rules over everything. And this morning, we are going to consider the fact that he is sovereign over both Satan and suffering. Those two things, Satan and suffering. So first of all, God is sovereign over Satan. And we don't just gather this from Job's response necessarily. We are also going to look at chapter 1 and verse 12, which we skipped over last week. 
But God is sovereign over Satan. And by God being sovereign over Satan, we mean that Satan and his demonic forces who are beneath him can only operate within the confines of what God allows. Ultimately, Satan can only attack or harass someone if the sovereign God of the universe allows him to. And we see this in Job 1 and verse 12, which reads, The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. What we see here is God giving Satan permission to attack Job. Now, not everyone would understand this text in this particular way, however, but I believe that this is indeed the correct way to understand this text. I was listening to one uh, speaker uh, speak on the subject of Job. His name is Todd White. He's a charismatic from down south. Uh, he's not exactly what I would consider to be a shining beacon of sound theology. And he said this in regards to Job in a talk that he was giving. We say God had to give Satan permission to do that. And so we get this picture when some tragedy comes that Satan had to ask permission to come and attack me. If God had to be asked permission for him to come and attack you, God could have stopped it. So he's to blame. Now Todd White's logic here, it isn't necessarily bad. There is, this is true. The logic is sound. It does stand to reason that if Satan had to ask God for permission to come and attack you, then God could have stopped it. God is therefore ultimately responsible. And he's right. God is ultimately responsible. He is ultimately sovereign over all things. It's just that in Todd White's mind, this is a problem here. God can't be responsible for bad things. God is only responsible for good things. Uh, but this was not Job's understanding here, and we see this in Job's response. Look at what he says in chapter 1 and verse 21. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. The text does not say here that the Lord has given and Satan has taken away. It says, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Yes, Satan was the one who directly attacked Job, but it was God in his sovereignty who allowed Satan to do that. And if God had not given Satan the green light, Job would never have experienced the suffering that he did. The only reason he experienced this satanic attack is because God in his sovereignty allowed it to happen. Good things and bad things, all of it comes from the Lord ultimately. And this is something that Scripture is very clear on. We're going to get to this in a couple more minutes when we talk more about uh, God being sovereign over suffering. But just to make the point, look for example at Isaiah 45 and verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. God is sovereign over all the earth, and He has sovereign, He has absolute authority over Satan and the demonic forces who are beneath Him. And this is something that we see throughout Scripture. This isn't just in the book of Job, we see it elsewhere as well. For example, in the New Testament, there was a demon-possessed man, a wild demon-possessed man, who lived in the tombs in the region of Gerasenes, and he came out to meet Jesus one day. And this is what the text reads. This is Mark chapter 5, verse 11 to 13. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission. And the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. You'll notice the wording in the text there. The demons are saying, allow us to go into the pigs. And then, of course, the text says that he gave them permission. He gave them permission. The demons wanted to go into the pigs. They were requesting permission to do that. Jesus gave them permission, and so they did. Another example would be when Satan asks 
to sift the disciples. And we read about this in Luke 22, 31. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. Satan has asked permission to sift the disciples. And why did he ask permission? Well, the reason is because he's not free to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. He's on a leash. He can extend his hand of destruction only as far as God in his sovereignty will allow him to and no further. Matthew Henry, in his commentary, he wrote this, It is a matter of comfort that God has the devil in a chain, in a great chain. He could not inflict Job without leave from God, first asked and obtained, and then no further than he had leave. It is a limited power that the devil has. He has no power to, to debauch men but what they give him themselves, nor power to afflict men but what is given him from above. And this is a profoundly comforting reality when we stop and think about it. To think that we are not at the mercy of Satan who is unhinged and can roam about doing whatever he wants, whenever he wants. He's on a leash. He's on a chain. We're not at his mercy. We are at the mercy of the sovereign God of the universe who loves us and cares about us. So that is the first area where we see that God is sovereign. He's sovereign over Satan. But he is also sovereign over suffering. If you're walking through a period of suffering in life, whatever that form of suffering may look like, uh, it is because God in His sovereignty, He has either directly caused it or allowed it to happen. One of those two. He's either directly caused it or He has allowed it to happen. We read in chapter 2 and verse 10. Uh, this is Job replying to his wife. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. A Job, he is attributing his suffering to the Lord. And he was, of course, right to do so, which we looked at earlier. Uh, for while Satan directly afflicted Job, it was God in his sovereignty who allowed it to happen. God is ultimately responsible. We see this elsewhere in Scripture. The writer of Ecclesiastes said this, When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. Another passage where we see this truth also expressed would be in Exodus 4. Moses, he is up on Mount Sinai having a conversation with God. God is commissioning him to go to Egypt to lead the Israelites out of bondage. And if you're familiar with the story, you will know that Moses did not really want to go. And he's coming up with all these excuses for why God should send someone else and not him. This is what Moses said to the Lord. This is Exodus 4, verses 10 to 11. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent neither in the past nor since we have spoken to you, nor since you have spoken to your servant i am slow of speech and tongue the lord said to him who gave human beings their mouths who makes them deaf or mute who gives them sight or makes them blind is it not i the lord who makes them deaf or mute who gives them sight or makes them blind it is the Lord, God in His sovereign will, makes them deaf or mute, gives them sight, makes them blind. The Apostle Paul, he was also very much familiar with the concept of suffering. And he was aware of the fact that God was in full and complete control of the suffering that was afflicting him. We read about Paul's thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12. This is what the text says. In order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God, uh, Paul, he pleaded with God to take the thorn in his flesh away, whatever the thorn may be. And this would suggest that God was in control. God was sovereign over that thorn in Paul's flesh. He had authority over it. He was in control of it. 
is no different with the suffering that we experience. Whether it be physical suffering, mental suffering, relational suffering, financial suffering, God either directly causes it to happen or allows it to happen. He is sovereign over it. The natural question that follows is, of course, why? God is sovereign over it. He's in control of it. Why would he allow this to happen, this suffering to happen? And that's a question that we are going to look at in the coming weeks. But for now, I want us to remember that God is in control of all things. He is sovereign over all things. He is sovereign over Satan, over the demonic forces who are beneath him. He is sovereign over suffering. Whatever suffering may be. He was sovereign over Job's suffering. He allowed it to happen. He is sovereign over our suffering as well. We do not suffer just due to blind fate or chance. God is in control of all things. And if we are suffering, it is because He has either directly caused it to happen or He has allowed it to happen. And this is actually indeed a wonderful and comforting truth that God is sovereign in this way. The great prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, he said this, He who feels that everything cometh, cometh to pass according to God's will hath a great mainstay to his soul. He need not be shaken to and fro by every wind that bloweth, for he is fast bound, so that he need not move. This is an anchor cast into the sea. While the other ships are drifting far away, he can ride calmly through. So that is point number one, God's sovereignty. That is what we can glean from Job's response here, is that God is sovereign. But we can also see Job's posture, how he responds to the sovereignty of God. And this brings us to point number two, which is man's surrender. Man's surrender. If it is God's will that we walk through periods of suffering... As we inevitably will in this life, we will walk through suffering. We considered that last week. The question becomes, what is to be our response? Job's response, when we consider it, it was one of surrender. It was one of submission. And that is to be our response as well. We read about this in chapter 2 and verse 9 and 10 when he's responding to his wife. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And all this Job did not sin what he said. A Job, he accepted the good from the Lord, but he also accepted the suffering that came by the sovereign will of God as well. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Job, he may not have necessarily been excited about the suffering that he was experiencing, but he accepted it. He accepted it. We, of course, uh, we want to accept God's blessings whenever He sees fit to send them our way. We often pray that He will send them our way. Uh, we, pray, we pray that He would bless us. And when, it, and when He does bless us, we accept those blessings. We welcome them with open arms. Uh, but what about those times of hardship that God in His sovereignty sees fit to bring our way? What about those times when God sees fit to lead us on a journey through the valley of the shadow of death? The valley will undoubtedly be different for each one of us. It may involve physical sickness. It may involve financial difficulty, extreme loneliness. It may involve the loss of one's dreams and hopes. The difficulty... The difficulty becomes when we try to fight God, when He is leading us into a period of suffering and we don't want to go, uh, and we fight Him. And in that sense, we even compound the suffering. We're no longer wrestling with just the circumstances that we find ourselves wrestling with. We're, we are now fighting God on top of that. We typically, we don't want to go into the valley of suffering because we don't like to suffer. We prefer comfort and ease. We don't want to experience pain. And the simple reason for that is because pain, it hurts. It's uncomfortable. And of course the problem it becomes when we 
uh, try to fight God and do everything in our power to not walk the road of suffering that he has uh, laid out before us. Jonah would be a prime example of this. Uh, Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh, even though the Lord wanted him to go. And so he hopped on a ship and headed in the other direction. He didn't accept uh, the road of suffering before him as Job did. Job, he is an example of what our attitude ought to be like. Uh, his attitude was one of acceptance, one of submission, one of surrender. He accepted the pain and suffering. He said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord uh, be praised. Jesus would be a better example, though, I would argue. Job is, of course, a great example of someone who accepted the Father's will of suffering. But Jesus is a better example yet. We find him in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's wrestling greatly with the road of suffering that was marked out before him. This is Luke chapter 22 and verse 42. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Uh, Jesus, of course, he did not want to go to the cross, and for obvious reasons. It was going to be a very difficult and a very hard road before him. This is why he prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Uh, Job uh, wouldn't have been overly happy about the uh, cup of suffering that he was drinking from either. Neither Jesus nor Job were uh, excited about the circumstances of life here at this point. As for Jesus, uh, despite his desires to be relieved of the suffering that was before him, he submitted to the will of his Father in heaven. Yet not my will, uh, but yours be done. Those are his words. Not my will, uh, but yours be done. There's an attitude there of surrender, of submission. Jesus, he accepted the will of the Father. He accepted uh, the suffering that was before him, knowing it was the sovereign will of his Father. And the same is, of course, true for Job. And the same ought to be true for us today. As Christians, uh, we are uh, to die to self. We don't live for ourselves. And if we are fighting God, if we're grumbling and complaining, uh, when He sovereignly leads us into the valley of suffering, uh, it is only because we have not completely died to self yet. It is only because we want to remain sovereign of our own lives. We want to steer our own ship instead of allowing God to steer it for us. And He will sometimes steer it into a storm, but he does that for his own purposes, as we will see again in the weeks ahead. A.W. Tozer, he said this, The Lord will not save those whom he cannot command. He will not divide his offices. You cannot believe on a half Christ. We take him for what he is, the anointed Savior and Lord, who is King of kings and Lord of all lords. He would not be who he is if he saved us and called us and chose us, without the understanding that he can also guide and control our lives. The question before us this morning is, will we allow God to control our lives? Will we allow him to lead us and to guide us? We know that sometimes he will lead us and guide us into a valley of suffering, and he will take us through that valley. He, he doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. He'll take us into it and he will take us out of it. Uh, but will we allow God to sovereignly direct our lives, uh, even if it involves going through uh, the valley of suffering? And will we respond as Job responded? The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. I want to conclude with just a brief story here. I remember the year 2005, and the reason I remember the year 2005 was because it was an extremely wet year. It was an extremely wet spring. 
I grew up on the farm, and that, that spring, 80% of our fields uh, were washed out and underwater. Uh, it got so bad, actually, that there were fish swimming in the fields because they had swam up from the river through the ditches and into the fields. I also remember that year, uh, I remember my dad mentioning to me how meaningful a particular song was on the radio that was playing at that time. It was the song, Blessed Be Your Name. It was playing on CHVN radio. Uh, if I recall correctly, it played regularly. And Dad mentioned how meaningful the song was to him. And I didn't necessarily, you know, as a kid, you don't necessarily think of how stressful of a time this is for Mom and Dad. Uh, but Dad mentioned how meaningful it was to him, the words to this song. And I'd like to read them for you. Blessed be your name, in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of, of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering, Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. That was Job's response, and I pray that that will be your response to when God sees fit in His sovereignty to lead you also into the valley of suffering as He did with Job. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word, for Your Word is good, Your Word is true. And Lord, we thank You for the wonderful example that we have in Job here of a man who did not curse You, who did not turn his back on You when You led him, when You allowed him uh, to walk into the valley of suffering. I pray, Lord, that the position, of, uh, the position of our hearts, the attitude of our hearts, would be that of submission, surrender to your sovereign will. Whatever it is that you see fit, Lord, uh, to allow to come our way, uh, may our trust be in you, may our hope be in you, and may we always bless your name, Lord, in the good times and in the bad. And we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.